so we can get started. I just wanted to extend a warm welcome to all the um, delegates joining us for the webinar, and then as people trickle in as well, they can they can join in. Um, I'm delighted to introduce um, Stacey Strong, who's a colleague of mine working at Clinical London. Uh, she's a medical retina um, specialist. Um, she's an exceptional clinician. Uh, she has a clinical lead position at Watford General Hospital, uh, and she works privately at Clinical London. And she's going to give us uh, hopefully a fascinating talk on diabetic retinopathy and uh, hopefully teach me some things uh, as well as a lowly VR surgeon. Uh, oh, you're very humble, Jen. I will hand over to Stacey and disappear off screen. Um, just to say, um, if anyone has any questions, you're very welcome to ask them as we go along. Um, the chat is open uh, and I will be monitoring it. So pop your questions in the chat um, and I will slide them in um, for Stacey to answer. Um, as we go. Um, so without further ado, um, we're going to kick off. Thank you very much. I am going to share my screen. Nice to meet everybody. I met some of you a bit earlier. And um, those of you that were logged on, again, apologies that the waiting room, the virtual waiting room didn't work when we wanted it to. So, share. Jen, assume you can see that? Yes. Yep. Okay, so nice to meet you all. Tonight's webinar is called A Masterclass in Diabetic Retinopathy. But there was one line missing off of the title, which is in the style of Game of Thrones. Now, for everyone who's seen Game of Thrones, um, you're probably going to love this talk. It's going to bring back memories of the show. Uh, I'm going to give you really nice analogies. I'm the queen of analogies. I love analogies. And um, to help you think and remember how what goes on in diabetic retinopathy. For everyone who hasn't seen Game of Thrones, um, spoiler alert, uh, if you are planning on watching it, a few spoilers in there. Um, but also, if I can just ask you to use your imagination and just come along on the journey. You, you won't recognize the characters, but just try and imagine where I'm going with the points that I'm making. That'd be great. Thank you. So nice to e-meet you. Uh, Jen did mention a few things about myself. So just to let you know again, I'm an NHS consultant at West Hearts. That's Watford and St Albans. I've been there since January 2021. My specialties are medical retina cataract. Um, my ophthalmology training began at Frimley Park Hospital, and then I moved a bit more north, uh, attending Moorfields, Western Eye, Central Middlesex Hospital. I was fortunate to do a teaching fellowship at Moorfields and in combination with UCL, where I did a PGCME degree uh, for a year. And I managed to do a, an interventional clinical study uh, where I got an MD, which was looking at cystoid macular edema in retinitis pigmentosa. So I started working at Clinical London, uh, I think April this year. Uh, at the same time, I also work, started working at Spire Bushy. So I know that there's quite a few different people from different areas around because we've targeted London but also my colleagues uh, in the ICS have also received an email so I think there's a lot of Hertfordshire optoms and GPs on here as well it's actually really helpful for us if you don't mind if you could maybe just put your title your job role and just the area where you live something like you know optometrist Watford into the chat it just it means that we can look back afterwards and see where people where which areas we managed to capture um, but don't feel obliged. And there are my declarations, my single declaration. So in the style of Game of Thrones, as promised, Bejef is coming. That's the title of the talk. And if I can ask you to please use the chat function, if you've got anything that you would like to ask, I'm very, very happy to be interrupted. And Jen is going to very kindly monitor the chat. And Jen, just feel free to interrupt me as we go. And the aims of the talk are to better understand the pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy and maculopathy, the DESP classification system, how diabetic retinopathy is managed and how maculopathy is managed, and some OCT scan interpretations, because everyone likes that, and the complications associated with diabetic retinopathy. 
And hopefully the quirky style will mean that you'll stay awake because it's seven o'clock in the evening. And also that you will hopefully remember a few things uh, as we go. And it gives you a chance to sort of see a bit of my personality. It's just difficult sometimes when you refer people in the in the private sector, you don't actually know who you're referring to, but hopefully you'll we'll get to know each other, even though I can't see you all on the screen as we go along. So diabetic retinopathy. The diabetes is a chronic disease. We know it's elevated blood glucose levels due to either suboptimal production of insulin um, or peripheral resistance of insulin. And according to the World Health Organization, there's about 422 million people worldwide with diabetes. And the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy amongst diabetics is about 27%. So there's a lot of blindness in the world secondary to diabetic retinopathy. The pathophysiology is, um, I've done, again, I'm the queen of analogies. Uh, so in the Game of Thrones, there's an overload of power hungry characters, and that basically causes dysfunction of the microenvironment that leads to death and destruction of everything around them. And in diabetes, there's an overload of glucose that causes dysfunction of the microenvironment leading to death and destruction of everything around them. So we're going to work our way through, starting with the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. I haven't included R0. R0 means that there is no diabetic retinopathy. So we're going to start with R1, parasite loss. So Ramsay Bolton, arguably the most disgusting character in Game of Thrones, was known for his horrible mutilation of certain body parts. And I've put him up as the character that uh, makes me think of what's happening when there's too much sugar going on because things get mutilated, the blood vessel lining loses its pericytes it, and it becomes weak. You then move on to get, if you have a weak wall, if you imagine you then get something called microaneurysms and hemorrhages. And for this, I think of Caitlin Stark, she was super protective um, and she had attempted to hold everything together, but one by one, just everything got taken away from her. She held on, held on, but her son got killed in front of her and she just, spoiler, red wedding. She was just hemorrhaging out everywhere. So she is what I liken to a hemorrhage. Now, have you ever asked yourself why a dot and a blot hemorrhage look round? Um, and why a flame hemorrhage looks linear. It's purely anatomical. So in a flame hemorrhage, which is very superficial in the nerve fiber layer where the nerves are lined up in a linear fashion, if something bleeds within those layers, it's going to seep along those linear cells. And that's why when you look at it from face on with a bulk, it will look like a flame. Whereas a dot and a blot, is where a bleed happens in between cells that are perpendicular. So when you actually look face on at it, the, the bleed stays in that section, doesn't sort of leak along the cells, it leaks this way in the cells. So that's why when you look on at it, it looks circular. And has anyone ever thought what the difference is between a dot and a blot hemorrhage is? So a dot is a small bleed and a blot is a bit bigger. Cotton wool spots, um, Lady Marjorie, she really has some nerve. She, you know, stands up to Cersei. She says, really, you know, has a lot of nerve with the things that she says to her. So I think of her as a cotton wool spot. And a cotton wool spot, as per the name of the nerve, is where you get infarcts of the nerve fiber layer that causes axoplasm buildup. And that's what you see in on OCT. It looks hyper reflective in the nerve fiber layer. Venous loops. So venous loops are shunt vessels and you're making a way around something. Jon Snow, he just always finds, it doesn't matter what it is, he always finds a way around everything. He, ma he, he makes it all the way through to the end of the series. I mean, not many people do. So what happens is they've shown on um, in studies that you get something very interesting called a non-thrombotic um, blockage. So, you know, in a retinal vein occlusion, you get a blockage and it bleeds. Here, you don't actually get anything that's, that comes and sits like an embolus, nothing like that, that, that blocks. There's no, it's not where an AV 
uh, an artery and a vein cross each other. It's just an area where, and, and it's not entirely understood how it happens, where the retinal vessel, the vein thickens. I guess it's similar, I was thinking about this earlier, it's similar to maybe in giant cell, giant, giant cell arteritis where the wall, you get thrombosis in GCA, but it's not because something's embolic, it's because the wall gets filled with inflammation. It, it must be something similar to that. You get an area where you get a non-thrombotic blockage. It then has a little bleed and then it becomes ischemic and then shunt vessels form to bypass that area of ischemia. So how would R1 diabetic retinopathy look on examination? Something like this, few dots, few blots, microaneurysms, but nothing too wild. So poll question number one, a patient with a single cotton wool spot in the right eye, but no obvious dot or blot hemorrhages with good vision will be classified as, and I'm going to bring the poll up for you now and see if I can get this to work. I'm gonna give you all about 15, 20 seconds to answer. I'm not gonna do that for every poll. <laughs> oh, fantastic guys. Oh, someone's changing their mind. Alrighty, I'm going to end the poll there. And one second, how do I share results? I don't know if you can see the results. And the answer is, as you um, agreed, most of you put A, that's because a cotton wool spot is actually not in the classification for diabetes. But what it does do is it gives you an indication of ischemia. Remember I told you that a cotton wool spot is due to infarction of the nerve fiber layer. So if you've got loads of cotton wool spots around, you're going to be thinking to yourself, this is a pretty ischemic looking retina and you're going to look really hard for R2 changes. But yes, officially not in the classification system. So guys, well done. R2. So multiple blot hemorrhages. These are three images taken from the diabetic screening program example shots. They are all R2 level. Oops. Sorry, I don't know why that's come back up. Has that gone off the screen for everyone? Off the screen for me. Okay. Um, what does it consist of in R2? Okay, venous feeding. Again, like a snake. A snake, little finger is very snake-like. And when you look at venous beading, it looks like a string of beads or some people say a string of sausages. And my question is, is it the fat part or the thin part that's the problem? And actually the answer is it's the fatter part. So the dilated part of the uh, vessel is what happens when you get ischemia. So in ischemia, the response of the blood vessel is to dilate. So again, venous beading, remember I'm saying a lot about ischemia, Everything, everything's going towards the ischemic of the eye. Um, venous beading is a sign that the eye is ischemic in the, in those patches. So again, venous beading, you remember the four, two, one rule, four quadrants of deep, dark blot hemorrhages, two quadrants of venous beading or one erma is R2. So that is the venous beading. Ermas, intraretinal microvascular abnormality, intra retinal, intra, okay? It's in, within the retina. It's not coming forward. And um, Sam Tarley, bless him, he's not the best fighter, but he uses his intelligence. He breaks into the citadel and looks for whatever he needs to use in the Game of Thrones, and he keeps his head under wraps, okay? He keeps himself undercover. He's not causing too much of a problem, that is what an erma is, okay? The ermas are effectively shunt vessels, again, that are growing in response to ischemia, and they're, but they're underneath the, the internal limiting membrane. So what would R2 diabetic retinopathy look like on examination? Obviously, I've shown you those three images before, but here's a pretty nasty looking R2. You can see lots of large, deep, dark 
blots, horrible hemorrhages. You've got exudates there. You've got some cotton wool spots. Um, it just looks pretty nasty. Um, and here you have an, um, just some figures quoted of the risk of progressing to proliferative diabetic retinopathy if you have severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Poll number two. So a patient with significant dot and blot hemorrhages. So I'm just moving my little box so I can read this. In four quadrants and the macula of both eyes, but no obvious fluid or exudates and good vision, six, nine, would be classified as, let's get poll number two up and see what you think. Okay. So again, significant dot and blot hemorrhages everywhere, but no fluid at the macula. Oh, it's torn. This is really interesting. This is a very interesting question. Okay, we are tied for A and B. So I'm just going to end the poll there. So the answer is A. So the question I think that needs to be answered is, well, why is it M0 if there's hemorrhage at the macula and not M1? That's what you're asking. So there's no fluid, there's blood. In the classification, in order for blood to count as M1, your vision has to be 612 or worse. And that is why the question was asked in the way it was asked. And I specified that the vision wasn't as bad as 612. Okay, but I, I completely understand why half of you went for that answer as well. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy. VEGF is coming. Vascular endothelial growth factor. So in the Game of Thrones, the wall, the northern wall, the wall in the north is there because we want to keep the bad guys out. We don't want them coming anywhere near the nice, healthy human side. Um, and I just liken this to the internal limiting membranes. The next time you're seeing a patient, just you're going to think of this wall the northern wall, and then you get neovascularization. So the good old Night King, he revives the dead. So what he does is he sends out a signal to all these dead people, and he makes them revive again and become a new type of species, vessel. And that's what I liken to neovascularization, new blood vessels being created when you don't want them. I mean, actually, it would be, it would be, Jen, wouldn't it be great if they actually worked? <laughs> I, I always find it really upsetting. Well, they work. They don't. Yeah. But it would, it's such a good idea. I mean, you know, if you believe in God, God made the eye to produce these vessels. Why don't they work? It's such a shame. It's, it's, it's actually gut wrenching that they don't actually work because that would be great if they did. But they don't. And um, they cause more trouble than they, they, they cause more harm than good. So talking specifically about VEGF, the VEGF family has seven types and it's the VEGF A specifically that we're talking about in diabetic retinopathy that promotes vascular permeability and angiogenesis. And even more specific is the slice variant VEGF A165. There's also placental growth factor that's associated with inflammation and makes everything leaky as well. Now I could give a whole talk, a one hour talk on just VEGF receptors or um, anti-VEGF drugs, but for the sake of this talk, just a rough overview, I just would like you to appreciate that it is the moment when the VEGF molecule engages with the top part of the receptor, and that's what makes the, the action happen. So all the nasty things that VEGF causes, is because the VEGF engages and then creates a problem afterwards. Just keep that in, in mind. So VEGF's around, it's engaging with all these receptors and it's telling uh, nasty things to happen. And here is the Night King riding poor Vesarian. We all love Vesarian. <laughs> and the wall is being blown, pushed through 
nasty things are about to happen and you get proliferation beyond the wall. So there are all your nasty um, neovascular vessels. And here on OCT, as you can see, OCT is amazing, by the way. It's, it's such a good way of seeing if something has breached the ILM. You look at a vessel and we're thinking, mm, is, is it neovascular, is it an IRMA? Just do a quick OCT through it. Oh, we know, we know, it's breached. It's, it's, uh, it's neovascularization or it hasn't breached, in which case we can sit tight for a bit longer. The one on the top is NVE and the one on the top is NVD. So it's coming from the disc. I mean, that's an amazing picture, don't you think? I mean, Jen, you and I, when we were training, we didn't have OCTA. We didn't have these amazing pictures that they've got now. But look, you can see a beautiful, or well, not so beautiful, neovascularization frond. Um, and look, it's surrounding that area of ischemia. Can you see the black, the black parts with no blood supply? It's ischemic. You can see why it's growing. I just think that looks amazing. So the classification of um, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we as clinicians, we need to know, is it high risk or not? So high risk, you might get tested on this later. You might want to pay attention is if you have at least a third of a size of an N of a disc diameter of NVD or any NVD, even if it's smaller associated with some blood or NVE, so elsewhere, remember elsewhere means it's not around the disc, it's over half a disc diameter associated with blood, and this has a poor visual prognosis. Diabetic maculopathy, brace yourselves. This is the um, most fancy slide that I have. I appreciate it's probably, I don't even know what the time is. It's 22 minutes past seven, you're all very tired. I will explain it, okay? so. The pathogenesis of DMO is complex and multifactorial. Effectively, there are some big players, some big guns here, okay? And the biggest one is probably VEGF. Having VEGF around just makes everything leaky. And we know that VEGF is released when you've got capillary, um, oh, I can't think of the word now, closure. What's the word? Capillary non-perfusion. But did you know that capillary non-perfusion can happen when there's VEGF, so it's cyclic. They both sort of encourage each other and everything just gets a hell of a lot worse. So more VEGF, more capillary non-fusion, more VEGF, more capillary non-fusion, et cetera, et cetera. You also have just generally hyperglycemia causes oxidative stress. It also makes products like protein kinase C get all angry and that causes vasoconstriction that causes more hypoxia and then you get capillary non-perfusion and then you get more VEGF and you can see there's this whole cycle that feeds in to effectively what happens which is breakdown of the blood retinal barrier everything starts oozing and as you can see the top picture is a normal macula or normal foveal area and the bottom one is thickened, and you can see some intraretinal fluid. There's a hint of possibly subretinal fluid there as well. Oh, just her name was just so good for a circinate. Circinate. I know some of you are smiling right now. Um, unfortunately, I can't see you. Um, I'd love to do this talk live. <laughs> that would be my preference, but it is what it is. <clears throat> so my analogy with exudates is if you have um, some blotting paper and you pour something through the blotting paper, the remnants and stuff that you're going to get left on the top, that's what exudates are. Can you get exudates without seeing fluid in the retina? Yeah, you can. Because actually think to yourself, how is the, how is the fluid being cleared? The, the fluid is being cleared by the retina itself. The retina is doing the job. The exudates are a sign that it's working harder than usual to clear the fluid. <clears throat> so if you've got a retina that is just about coping with this increased amount of fluid that's being released, you'll just see some exudates, but you won't see the fluid. It's happening. It's just that the retina is coping. If it's not coping, if the tap is turned on too much and the plug is not draining enough, you're going to get loads of fluid and you'll see the exudates as well. So clinically significant macular edema, that terminology was before OCT used hugely. Uh, the ETDRS study coined the term. 
And I'm sure you've all, I won't go through it, but I'm sure you've heard of these three situations that causes CSMO. Um, but now we have OCT, so things are slightly different. Um, before I go on to that, we have another poll question. So fingers at the ready. Patient with the odd dot and blot hemorrhage in the periphery and macula of both eyes, which you now know doesn't necessarily mean M1, um, with no obvious fluid or exudates, but the vision is 612 in the right eye and 69 in the left eye would be classified as, and here we go. Okay, let's see who's awake, who's listening. You guys, you guys are amazing. <laughs> I'm actually so happy. Um, brilliant. I'm so pleased that you chose C. Um, and you know why it's C? Because I told you already that blood doesn't necessarily mean that it's M1 unless the vision is 612 or worse. That 612 doesn't have to be from diabetes. That could be from cataract. But if it's 612, then it's called M1. There has been an update to the screening program guidelines. And now the, the graders who, by the way, are amazing. I, the screening program graders are excellent. They have to go undergo rigorous training in order to be a grader. Um, they now actually are allowed a little bit of um, slack in terms of whether they refer to us or not. If a patient says they're amblyopic, if the patient says they've got really bad cataract, if the patient says something that is going to, when they look at that picture, make them think, mm, it's probably not from the diabetes, they they don't have to refer the patient to us, okay? But um, if they think it's diabetic related, then they will. So as I was saying, we now use OCT. Um, so what the graders do, because they don't at present have OCT in the... Um, community in the in the screening program, although that might be coming as well, hopefully coming. And um, they use surrogate markers instead, and this is what we use as the basis of or, or when they refer it in as M1. So M1 is any exudate within one disc diameter of the central fovea, any group of exudates within the macula, or microaneurysms and or hemorrhages within one disc diameter of the center of the fovea, with a best corrected visual acuity of 612 or worse, which I think I have thoroughly um, exhausted the point on now. So the diabetic eye screening program couldn't live without them. They um, take a lot of the workload off the hospital eye service and they just filter in people, the patients that really do need to be seen by an ophthalmologist. Um, so they, they offer annual screening um, to everybody from the age of 12. They do disc and macular photographs and they don't have OCT at present, but they are planning to include it from 2024 for high risk maculopathies. And they're also planning to extend the screening intervals for certain patients in the future. And here you can see, I mean, we've been through most of it of what you classify as R1, what you classify as R2 um, and what you classify as M1. The management of diabetic retinopathy. So I always try, uh, different clinicians will be, you know, will do things slightly differently, but I always try and give people at least some time to sort themselves out because it is a bit of a shock if you are 25 and you get referred into the hospital because you've got diabetic retinopathy. Okay, if they're horrendously neovascular, that's different. But if there are two, and their HbA1c is not great, and they've had a, a bit of a kick up the bum by having the referral to us, I will say to them, I'll write to the GP and I'll say, look, you are you need to work really hard with your GP and your nurse specialist to try and improve your HbA1c, um, because otherwise you're going to end up, you know, go getting worse. But I don't, I don't, I try not to rush, rush into treatment if I, if I think, if I think that person has potential to improve things. And remember, you can't, you shouldn't advise someone to improve things too quickly because the eyes get used to the status. And if you change that, the eyes don't like change, even if it's good change, if it's done too quickly. So everything has to be done, but done not too quickly. So 
that's that's my approach anyway. So first of all, to tighten their blood sugar, as just mentioned. Blood pressure is an interesting one. Um, about 30% of um, younger diagnosed diabetics and 75% of older diagnosed diabetics also have hypertension. The thought is that with the higher blood pressure, there's higher blood amounts and that that, that um, makes the retinal vessels unhappy. But the uh, jury is out in terms of evidence. It's We're not sure either way how much of an effect it has. Some studies show clear effects, some studies don't. However, we do tell all patients with diabetes to try and keep their blood pressure as tightly controlled as possible. So that's what I do in the first instance, if I can, if I don't think they're going to be a recurrent DNA, so someone who doesn't attend. <clears throat> Sorry, two sex. Mm. But if I'm worried about someone, um, I might, mm, my mindset of treating them might be slightly different. The treatment of neovascularization is pan-retinal photocoagulation, which I liken to the fire released from the dragons. And what laser does, if you think you are, you are burning the retina and causing small burns, that then kills off the photoreceptors. So you reduce the metabolic activity required. And what that does is it allows oxygen to come through into the retina more easily. Um, and then that reduces VEGF, which ultimately is what we want to get rid of. So here is a lovely picture of a retina that has been quite well lasered. Question, there's no poll, but is it only R3 level diabetes, diabetic retinopathy that receives PRP? The way I'm asking a question, the answer is gonna be no. So fluorescein angiography, which I'm a big, big fan of. We have a fluorescein angiography and ICG at Clinica in London. There's not many places that have it in the private sector, but we do have one. We're very fortunate. Um, fluorescein is brilliant at demonstrating how ischemic a retina is. You know, Jen and I might, you know, know what we're looking for in the fundus. And we can say they've got blots and dots and loops and everything. But we can't see this, only a fluorescein angiography or wide field OCTA, um, which is quite rare as well, will be able to see these horrible, extensive areas of lack of blood supply. If I see someone with a nasty looking R2, I'm probably going to say to them, look, just have a fluorescein angiogram. Let's take a look. Let's see if there's areas that I can't see with my Volk lens. And if someone looks like this all the way around, they, they're going to become proliferative very, very soon. So I would offer them prophylactic PRP um, to prevent them going that way. I guess the other question is, do we laser all our three patients? No, we don't. Are you surprised? I think you're surprised. I think people are surprised. Jen, do you think they're surprised by that? I'm right. surprised. Are you surprised? So don't be surprised. Um, if someone has high risk um, R3 disease, definitely, definitely laser. If they're not high risk, there's a discussion between the consultant and the patient. Obviously, you have to, I'm not going to say for every single patient you do this, but it's a discussion. You think of their situation, just like I said to you before, is this someone that that is now going to sort themselves out? You can watch them. You can watch some R3s. Oh, you can. Um, you just, yeah, it's, it's every patient is individual and there's no exact science um, unless they look completely awful, in which case you would laser. Poll question number four. Pan-retinal photocoagulation works as follows. Light is absorbed by what? It's converted then to thermal energy. This leads to a burn of what this reduces metabolic activity improves oxygenation and inhibition of angiogenic um, stimulators and let's go on to poll number four so what absorbs it and then what is burnt that's the question what absorbs the light and what gets burnt while the people are voting stacy i'm just mm -hmm. going to pose a question from the mm -hmm. chat yes please so after PRP, is it normal for the optic nerve bit to become pale? 
and also in a diabetic patient who is in the screening service, do we need to notify the GP if we see a microaneurysm or dot hemorrhage of the macula? Okay, so I'll start with the first question. To answer that question, I want you to all think what makes up the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is made up of how many million fibers? 1.5 million fibers, I think. Jen, you know better than me. And all of those nerve fibers come from all around the retina and they feed in to make up the optic nerve. So in answer to the question, if you perform extensive laser and you're killing off those, those cells, those nerves that are going to the optic nerve, yes, you will cause a pale optic nerve because you're killing off the nerve, the nerve fibers. Um, it's a bit like glaucoma, actually. If you think about glaucoma, um, that's pressure. Pressure pushes on the nerve fibers. The nerve fibers that are coming out the nerve, the ones that are on the top, go all the way to the periphery. The ones that are more protected are the ones underneath. They come from the macula and closer to the optic disc. When the eye gets increased pressure and starts pushing on those nerves, it squidges the ones on the top first. So the peripheral ones all seem to, to start to go first. And that's why you get peripheral defects starting in glaucoma rather than central ones. But it's the same look on visual field with panretinal photocoagulation as it is with glaucoma. Actually, that makes it really difficult sometimes when you're doing glaucoma testing on patients to say, have they got worse because of their glaucoma or because they've had PRP? But yeah, good question, whoever asked that. And so the second one was about, um, do you need to inform the GP if you see something? Is that correct? Uh, yep, that's right. If you see um, uh, a microaneurysm, a microaneurysm or dot, dot hemorrhage at the macula and the patient's already being screened in the screening service, do they yeah, also yeah. need to? So um, again, the first thing I was, I was going to say, say is ask the patient, are they being screened? When was their last screen? If their last screen was like a week ago, two weeks ago, then you probably don't need to because the GP will have already been informed by the diabetic screening programme. If they haven't been seen for maybe a few months onwards or anything that you're worried about, especially if there's fluid there, then yes, you can let the GP know and then the GP can always refer them into the hospital eye service or they might get another uh, screen by the desk. So here, um, so I think about when you go on holiday, it's the melanin in your skin, isn't it? That's tell me if I'm wrong, but it's the melanin that's the pigment that absorbs the light. Correct? Am I correct? <laughs> if I'm correct. Um, the pigmented part of the, the eye is the RPE, the retinal pigment epithelium. So it's the pigment that absorbs the light, that heats up, and then it cooks the nerves uh, and the cells that, that are lying on top of it. So the RPE absorbs it, and it cooks all the retinal cells above it, like the photoreceptors. So um, it is, sorry, I'm trying to do it, trying to control everything. It is A, that is correct. Well done for everyone that put A. Anti-VEGF medication. So this is like Tyrion. Um, oh, I can't see what I've put up there. I think I've put political um, maneuvering, something like that. So he just knows, again, he's not the greatest fighter, but he just knows where to place himself in order to get whatever he wants done. And he can mop things up. Um, and that's really what happens in um, anti-VEGF. And I want you to try and remember the mopping up analogy. So on the left was what I was describing earlier and asking you to remember, which is when the VEGF particle is trapped, it then causes the problem to happen. So what Tyrion does by uh, mopping everything up is um, he basically sorts stuff out before it becomes a problem. So that's what anti-VEGF does. It goes around whether it's X molecule, small molecule, big molecule, binding affinity, X, Y, it doesn't matter. They all do the, a similar thing, which is they mop up VEGF particles so that they don't allow them to bind to the receptor to cause the problem. The only problem is they don't last very long, which is um, uh, hopefully they're working on some longer term solutions. 
Um, again, I'm not going to go through every single particle, but just know that they are all slightly different to one another. Um, depending on which drug company you speak to, they will sell their product to you differently. Um, I don't know whether I um, whether I can say which one I have a, a preference to, but um, I would say that they all come under the same umbrella, and that there, there is one in there that has a 10% risk of causing vasculitis, um, which is actually, I can say that one because that's fact, that is brolukizumab, um, which the other ones don't have that risk. So personally, we, we're using less brolukizumab um, at present. Poll number five, which drug has a biosimilar available to use in the NHS for DMO? Launching now. Whoa. Okay, okay. Those of you at the end, wait and see what everyone else has put. I understand before you decide. Lovely. Those at the beginning, very brave. Well done. Okay. We just about, you just about got there. Just about, yeah, keep putting Lucentis. Okay, so the answer is Lucentis. So let me just explain what a biosimilar is. So a biosimilar, so what happens with the drugs? They get made by drug companies. They cost millions and millions and millions and millions of pounds and they get a patent and you can't do anything else. You, you, can't, you can't copy anything until the patents run out. When the patents run out, people then scramble to quickly try and produce the same drug or as similar to that uh, approved drug as possible to then basically come out and say, well, hey, buy our drug. We're going to be lots, we're going to be a lot cheaper than the branded. You know, it's like it's like Nurofen and ibuprofen. Yeah. You know, you want to pay a bit more and pay for Nurofen, fine. But if you want to go and buy some like 60p ibuprofen over the counter, it's going to do the same thing. So that's my analogy. Well, a fact with biosimilars. At the moment, we only have a biosimilar out for Lucentis. So Lucentis, remember, the drug is called ranibizumab. There's um, there's definitely one out called Ongarvia. I think there's also another one or two out. I'm sorry, apologies. I don't know the names of the other ones. Um, but you'll find, you might see a lot of people on biosimilar Lucentis, um, but they are meant to act exactly the same as the branded version. Poll number six, which of the following drugs is not licensed for the treatment of DMO? Number six is coming. While that one's running, mm -hmm. and we've got another question. Mm -hmm. So in relation to the question about the dot and blot hemorrhage or microaneurysm at the macula, mm -hmm. Uh, if in the scenario there is no fluid and the vision is great and the last DRS was six months ago or longer, and mm -hmm. would it just be a letter of information to the GP or not required? So just a if dot block. Oh okay, what, with an OCT that's showing no fluid? Uh, presumably. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother because that's the same as background. You know, it's, you just happen to have it in the macula. Got a yep. dot you dot or a blot at the macula you have to you have to still think the macula is still part of the retina it's just we like calling the macula a separate thing because well dmo always happens at the macula i went to an amazing talk once um jen i don't know if you ever went on the macula course at moorfields the first guy that speaks does an amazing talk on why you only get the edema at the macula like why don't you get loads of like it always happens at the macula and I wish I had his slides to explain how it happens, um, but I don't. But that is why we grade the macula separately. But but yeah, ultimately, in answer to that question, think of the macula as just part of the retina. Unless there's exudate there or fluid, um, I wouldn't, wouldn't worry. Okay, end of the poll. Okay, so, so mm, interesting again. So you, you did get it as a team. You did get the right answer in total which is a vastin um, a little bit surprised that that's I would have thought that would have been more well known um, but now you know so a vastin is unlicensed 
It's unlicensed for everything. Um, do we use it? Yeah, we do a lot because there are certain conditions where the NHS either won't fund something, but we know it's going to work. Um, an example would be macular degeneration. I know I'm going off topic from diabetes here, but macular degeneration where someone's got a vision of 6, 7.5, they're too good to receive a licensed, nice uh, approved product. We would use Vastin or consider using Avastin. Um, Avastin is also used um, for diabetes. I will tell you about it a bit later, but Avastin is not licensed for anything, yet we use it a lot. Poll question number seven, which of the following drugs is licensed for use in DMO, but not RVO? So something that you can use for DMO, but not retinal vein occlusion. Don't upset me, guys. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's, again, this is so interesting. So for Bismo, uh, thank you, everybody. Babismo is uh, sort of the latest drug that's come out. It's the, the brand name for the drug, which is called Farisimab. And Babismo at the moment is only licensed for DMO, um, not RVO. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure at some point it's going to be coming up for RVO. I think the FDA are soon to approve it in America. And uh, it, it's always about a year later that the the that Europe follows but at the moment it's Vermismo. Well, one more poll question lot in a row um, how many microns of central macular thickness is required in order for a patient to be funded on the NHS to receive a licensed anti-VEGF treatment so how thick does their um, central macular thickness need to be in order to get something like Lucentis, Ilia, Prisma? Okay, whoever puts 200 microns, I think the retina is only 200 microns or something thick to start with. So I don't know if you can change your answer, but it's only 200, like the natural thickness is only about 200 microns. Can you take it away and have another, have another shot? <laughs> no, okay. So it's actually 400 microns. So I think the majority of you put that. But it's good to know. So it has to be over 400 microns in order to get a nice approved drug. What about steroid medication? So for this, I've put Tormund and Brienne as Ozodex and Iluvian. So they're both steroid. Um, Ozodex lasts for around three to six months. Iluvian can last up to three years. Um, recently, we were only allowed to give it any steroid for patients who had had cataract surgery. But actually, that has recently been changed. Um, Watford were one of the first trusts to um, use steroid in diabetics who hadn't had cataract surgery, so phakic patients. We were part of the, before it was um approved by nice uh, we were using a watford for about a year um, but it's now been approved by nice so essentially any diabetic who perhaps has failed and a course of anti-vegf and you're thinking of other options for them you can now think about giving them a steroid pellet or steroid in, in yeah, steroid pellet we always start with ozodex because the risk of giving steroid is that it can increase the pressure in the eye and if someone tolerates the Ozodex and they don't get a rise in pressure and they're not, they don't have glaucoma to start with because it's a complete contraindication for Iluvian. Um, and say you do an Ozodex and a second Ozodex and you're thinking, do you know what? I'm going to give someone something that's going to last them a bit longer and save them from having so many injections. Then you're going to give them Iluvian. It's not as punchy though. It's like... I don't know what percentage it is. I don't want to get it wrong, but it's just, it's not as punchy as Ozodex. 
um, but it lasts a, a long time. Um, secret can still give additional top ups of other things when they have ilubin. So it shouldn't it shouldn't stop you from giving ilubin. You give it, and then if they still get fluid there, you can top them up with other stuff. Sorry, Jen. Uh, yep. So just uh, one more question. Um, asking how far away from the fovea does the five hundred do the four hundred microns have cut off need to be for treatment? Has to be at the centre, literally within within that central ring. Okay. So um, next, I put here that they are steroid implants that slowly release medication over time to reduce the number of injections required, and they both dissolve over time, but the scaffold still remains with Ilevia. And so I've had patients where I've given them something and they've got terrible floaters, like from the Ozodex, um, but that's okay. You can say to them, it's fine. It will completely dissolve. The Ilevia, it is smaller, but it doesn't actually go away. The scaffold will always stay. It's just something to bear in mind. Poll question number nine, and I'm aware of the time. I've got nine minutes. Am I going to get through it all? Ozodex releases dexamethasone for up to how many months? And Iluvian releases fluocinolone for up to how many years? Poll oh, number nine. Okay. Go for it. Who is listening? Who is listening? Everyone was listening. <laughs> Most people were listening. Most people were listening. 45% of people were listening at 10 to 8. I think I will take that. 45, 42, 44% of people were listening. So the answer is up to six months uh, for the Ozodex and up to three years for the Ilubian. Okay, question 10. What should you consider if a diabetic patient has R1M0 in one eye and R3AM0 in the left eye. And my question's really saying, if someone has really asymmetric disease, what should you consider? Excellent, excellent. So yes, the answer is ocular ischemic syndrome. Um, I just put that in for kicks about the asymmetric hypertension. I don't think I don't think you can get asymmetric. Can you get asymmetric hypertension? I don't know. Um, so how does uh, ocular ischemia work? Well, imagine if your carotid artery is clogged up. Everything that that supplies is gonna is not going to feed what it should. So here, if you're clogged in your neck and, and your carotid artery is clogged, your ophthalmic artery won't be able to supply where it needs to supply. So you won't have, you'll become ischemic, but not because of diabetic retinopathy, because of the carotid, the blockage. So quick OCT interpretation. Here we can see gross intra-retinal fluid with dots of exudates here. Um, anyone looking here might call that VMA, vitreo macular adhesion. The next one, oh, and that would be, that would qualify. That's what, that's gonna be way over 400 microns. That would definitely qualify for um, drugs to anti-VEGF or Ozodex. Um, here we have something similar, intraretinal fluid, exudates. Um, again, this is going to be, that will be over 400 microns, so they will qualify. And then here's something that, you know, you can see there's really good foveal contour. The vision is probably really good, but they've got a little bit of exudate here. This is, this is similar to what I was talking about earlier, where they're, they're working hard to pump the fluid out and they're managing, but you can see that there's something going on because there's exudate there. So the last section of my talk is complications associated with diabetic eye disease, vitreous hemorrhage. So if someone comes in and they're not diabetic and they have a vitreous hemorrhage, you need to consider whether they have an underlying retinal tear. So those patients are more often than not taken to theatre for a vitrectomy. Um, and I think there's quite a high risk of them having a tear. It gets a bit complicated if someone says that they're diabetic because then the clinician's thinking, hmm, so have they just got a vitreous hemorrhage because one of their neovascular fronds has bled and it gets a bit tricky obviously we'll do ultrasound to check to see if we can see a tear 
But if they have good vision in the other eye, sometimes we sit on these vitreous hemorrhages for, you know, maybe six weeks, eight weeks, and then we bring the patient back and see how they're doing. If they're clearing, and then we can get a view of the retina and we're happy that it's flat, we just continue to let them clear themselves. What sometimes happens though, is they start clearing and then they re-bleed and then they start clearing and then they re-bleed and they get to a point where actually they've been obscured. The fundus has been obscured now for a while, months. You know that it's happening because there's nasty proliferative disease underneath, which you can't get laser on for when it looks like this. So you send them to your lovely retinal specialist, vitreoretinal specialist like Jen, to consider vitrectomy and endolaser and sometimes delamination as well. That means that's where they cut the pegs of these nasty vessels to try and stop them from leaking in the future. And Jen, I was going to refer to you to ask um, how your, your approach to someone who comes in for the first time with a vitreous hemorrhage and they say, I'm diabetic. Um, when do you decide to to not to sit on them and when do you decide to operate yeah. thanks Stacey I mean it's exactly what you said um if they are diabetic the best clue you can get is from the other eye uh, if the other eye has no retinopathy or literally just minimal background retinopathy you've got a very high suspicion there's something else going on and it's um, not necessarily even hemorrhagic PVD with retinal tear it could be it could be a vein occlusion that's bled it could be a peripheral or central um coronal neovascularization that's bled uh, it could be, high, you know, a hypertensive or a macroaneurysm bleed. It could be any one of those. But you would take them to theatre to explore probably in that scenario quite quickly. Often we treat these as a, as a MAC on detachment type of patient. Mm -hmm. In a diabetic where the other eye looks grotty, mm -hmm. you would probably bank on the side of watching and waiting because it's likely to be proliferative. And in this scenario, again, you you know, if they're clearing at one to two months, then you leave them to clear. And if not, um, then you plan surgery, which isn't desperately urgent. But, you know, again, within, within months. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Really handy having you on the, the webinar. Um, so detachment, and I'm not talking about a regmatogenous detachment, although you can get reg regmatogenous detachments also, of course, in diabetics. But I'm talking more about tractional retinal detachments. So we've got some patients at Watford who have a tractional retinal detachment, but I haven't referred them to someone like Jen. And um, I do have a poll question to explain why. Um, but I just want you to have a think. Why would I sit on a tractional retinal detachment? Am I being negligent? Or is there a reason? And here's the poll. So a diabetic patient with tractional retinal detachment should be referred to a vitreoretinal specialist when? Always? Please don't put that, otherwise you're calling me negligent. <laughs> if the tractional retinal detachment involves the macula, if it involves a quarter of the retina, a third of the retina, or half the retina. And this is the last poll question, so enjoy. Oh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Mm, I think it might be this one. Oh, no, no. Oh, I don't know if I've got number 11. Uh, number 11's not working. Okay, I will just tell you. The answer is if it involves the macula. Okay, so that if it starts to involve the macula, then we refer patients on. Um, a lot of the time they can just sit there. These, you, if you get a peripheral tractional retinal detachment, remember it's happening because of scar tissue and fibrosis it's pulling. Sometimes it just stays there and you watch them for years and it doesn't change. And finally, neovascular glaucoma. So not only can you get NVE and MVD, but you can get NVI, so on the iris, like this, rubiosis, it's the other, other term for it, or NVA, which is in the angle, which I can't show you a picture of. Well, I could, because I could take it from Google, but you can't see it straight on. You have to put a lens onto the eye in order to bend the light so that you can see into the angle. And in this eye, for example, you will definitely see neovascularization of the angle, NVA. How do we treat it? You know, I said that we use Avastin. So this is when we use Avastin. So if someone has rubiosis, um, we don't have anything that's licensed to treat that with or using NICE. So we would give them Avastin, which can beautifully regress these vessels. But ultimately, we need to put tons of PRP on because the eye is going to be terribly ischemic and also consider IOP lowering 
uh, drops that might be something that, so techniques that might be anything from drops to you know cyclodiode if it's for example a non-seeing eye and you want to stop it from becoming a there's one thing having a blind eye that's another thing having a painful blind eye oh quick quiz do i have time oh does everyone want to stay for an extra two minutes extra quiz there's nothing to push it's just me talking through when would Sam advise Jilly to go for diabetic screening during pregnancy? The answer is first trimester. By the end of the first trimester, they should go. If any diabetic retinopathy is spotted, they are brought back between 16 and 20 weeks. If it's not, then they're brought back at 28 weeks. And diabetic screening should continue until six months after. Well, they're going to be screened anyway, annually, but um, it sh they should be seen more often, more frequently up to six months after the birth. If Bran, I love this question, if Bran was a stage of diabetic retinopathy, what would he be? And the answer is background because he's boring. And um, what should you include in your consent form for patients who are having laser? Everything from bleeding, inflammation, floaters, um, requirement for more laser, um, reduced vision. Uh, children are also affected by diabetes, by diabetic retinopathy. What age do, are they invited to come for screening? I told you in my talk, it's 12. Um, if Tyrion were to ask da Daenerys about the high risk features of PDR, what would they say? What would he say? I remember it's anything over half disc diameter of near vascularization on the disc or smaller than that associated with hemorrhage or NVE associated with hemorrhage. And I've now enlightened you that we don't always treat something that's not high risk. And we sometimes treat R2 that hasn't got any proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And the last question before I finish the night off is what is the connection between George Martin who wrote Game of Thrones and diabetes? And the answer is there was a chap called George Martin. There's a surname for him, George Martin Guest who was productive in the field of metabolic disorders. Um, that is the end of my talk. I really hope that with this quirky style webinar, I've kept you awake and that you've managed to um, take away with you how diabetic retinopathy and maculopathy happen, a bit about the desk classification system, how we manage both of those situations, a bit about OCT scans, a bit about the complications as well. If you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to stay. There's um, one more question, Stacey. Mm -hmm. um, going, how soon would you treat NVI? Immediately. Immediately. Get the Avastin in that day. Maybe bring back for PRP a week later. Why? Because rubiosis makes the iris really uh, bad at dilating. And in order to get on good PRP, you need to have a nice dilated pupil. So you, you get the Avastin in and you give it a week. And then the pupil hopefully opens up a lot better. And then you just blitz them with PRP. And then you bring them back two weeks later to blitz them with more PRP. And two weeks later to blitz them with more PRP. Okay, one more. Um, pregnancy and anti-VEGF, any risks there? Yes, there can be risks. Um, I don't think they're um, ethically able to... Uh, do tests and find out whether whether there are risks or not. Although I think there was a rainbow study done for um, ROP where they gave um, babies um, anti-VEGF. So it's, I mean, I don't even know if that study has gone on long enough to know if there are any long-term complications. I think there's theoretical risks, uh, which is why most people who are pregnant will probably opt for, an, well, hmm. There's two, there's two camps. There's one camp that will say, oh, just wait, 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 don't do anything. Let them push the baby out and then everything will get better with their macular edema. And then there's another camp that's like, let's get in an Ozodex because the risk of the steroid is, is not going to really do much for the, for the fetus. Someone's asking about the Morfield's retina course. I don't know if anyone knows any details. It's usually um, oh, the macular course was for internal. It was for internal staff. I oh, know actually, no, there were some people from. Um, it's called the macular course, and I it used to be run by oh, who's the oncology chap, Jen? The um the guy now, or do you mean um he used to run it? Mandy. Yes, Mandy Psago. He ran it. I think he's handed over to someone else now. But um, if you type in macular course, Moorfields, Mandeep Sago, it might come up with with something. It's done annually, I think. It's really good. 
Okay. Um, so another question, um, anti-VEGF for R3A with no more room for laser, what would be your protocol? I do it in the private sector. So I love, um, I think it regresses these vessels so nicely. Um, and now NHS, I give a Vastin. If I see a florid, horrible complex, I'll just give a Vastin. Private sector, you can give other things. At the end of the day, it's under the same umbrella. It all does the same thing. But yes, I am I, I am personally quite pro. But And in Europe, they do that all the time. But it's not officially licensed on yeah. the NHS. Yeah. And question. then... Um... If there are severe changes of DR seen in the practice, is it best to send to the GP or desk or straight to hospitalized service? Oh, that's a good question. It's similar to the question before, isn't it? If you notice something that's that's new, um, I would probably send to the GP and then the GP can inform desk and the desk might screen them first before they come to us. That's what I think that was probably the best way. And my next webinar, plug, 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 for anyone who enjoyed tonight and wants to come back for more fun and games uh, in AMD. It's going to be Thursday, the 21st of September at seven o'clock. I'm happy to have any suggestions for themes, um, but anything sci-fi fantasy related, I'm, I'm usually in. Thank you so much, Jen, for chairing. Pleasure. I just wanted to say thank you, every, everybody, for coming along. Uh, it was a very informative and very entertaining webinar. We all stayed very wide awake, I think. And uh, I certainly learned some things, and I hope you all have taken something away from it. Um, there is a, so yeah, people are asking, there like will be a recording well. available. Yeah, a big thank you to the Clinica team who are on behind the scenes. We've gone through a lot to get this webinar out. So thank absolutely, you. Absolutely, absolutely. And they, they worked hard on, on it. Um, there will be um, a recording available. You will get a form to fill in for some feedback. Um, and once we get that back, you know, once we collate it, um, um, there will be a released recording. And yeah, please do join us for more seminars. There are six masterclasses in OCT. Well, if you come to one of my um, masterclass and <laughs> OCT webinars, um, we can do another one of those. Sounds good. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening and go and watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> See you later. Bye.